Um, I'm from Phoenix. I, I was originally from Utah, and so this is you know nice to be home. But can someone turn down the snow? It's a little cold. We're going to hit 100 on Sunday. I'm Rob Richardson. So here's the part where I say I'm definitely going to post the slides on my blog tonight. Um, in a week, you're going to check. In a month, you're going to check again. Three months, you'll get tired of emailing me. In a year, I'll reply, and I'll go, I'll definitely post them tonight. You can hit my blog right now, robrich.org. Click on Presentations. And here's CICD on the Microsoft stack. And that is the presentation we'll look at right now. So who am I? Um, this is also the About page on my blog. Some of the things that I've done. Um, AZ Give Camp is particularly awesome. We bring volunteer developers together with charities who otherwise couldn't afford software services. We start Friday after work building them software. Sunday afternoon, we deliver completed software. Sleep is optional, food is provided. Outside of Utah, I say uh, sleep is optional, caffeine provided. <laughs> so that is a lot of fun. Uh, I was working on the Gulp team in version 2 and version 3. Um, that was a lot of fun. Friend of Redgate, Microsoft partner, um, some of the user groups that I help run. Uh, I made a comment on the .NET Rock show, and I got a mug. <laughs> so that was particularly awesome. So the guy in front of the room is kind of boring. Um, but let's dig into Microsoft uh, CI/CD. So, um, have you ever heard this? Deployments are hard. Um, we can't deploy today because he's absent. We're going to spend a whole lot of time on the call merging. That's the symptom. Here's the problem. The problem is that big Word document. Oh, but. Um, that step on page eight, we don't do that anymore. And um, that step on that, that step 13, yeah, sorry, you don't have access to that. You have to go bug him. Oh, and, and step four is really vague. You'll have to figure it out. So I'm really glad you started early because, you know. But we always do this at two in the morning because our users aren't using our system. So um, we're always tired. Uh, uh, yeah, that makes for great deployments. So why do we do CI/CD? We're after reliability. We're after consistency. We're after validation. The topic is automate all the things. Why do we do CI/CD? So that we get better at this. If it's hard, do it more, and then you'll get better at it. If deployments are hard, do it more. Really, why do we do CI/CD? Because machines are cheaper than people. Is there a task that is really cool that I can get a machine to do instead of a person? Now that person can go off and build business value instead. How quickly can we get to the point where those people are delivering business value and the machines are validating the product? Said me. Right now. So how do I start? Here's the fictitious scenario that we'll start at. See if this sounds familiar. I have this website. I have a few tests. How do I begin? So here's my solution in Visual Studio. I just did a file new project, and it's just a regular ASP.NET website. I click the Yes, I would like a test button, so I have some tests here. I flip them over to be X unit tests. They're a little bit easier to automate. That's not relevant, but it's kind of cool. And I also added the Octopack package to the web application. So it's for the most part. A regular project, you know, I love the, the project, the About page always says um, it's based at Microsoft's headquarters. I wonder how many of the Google search results will take me to Microsoft for my business because I forgot to change the About page. I think that's awesome. So I'm going to right click on the web application. I'm going to choose the Publish menu and, and I'm going to send it up. And that is DevOps. I was able to launch, uh, I love this quote by Damian Brady. Friends don't let friends right-click publish. That's not DevOps. That's not validating our process. That's you know circumnavigating the process because uh, ops won't let us deploy. The five steps to CI/CD. We start out taking our source code that is that you know 13-page Word document. We start out. We get it in the source control. Next, we do the build. The next. 
we can get our build to run unit tests. Probably that's super easy, and we can get to that step really fast. The next step is to do automated deployments. That's where we start taking the steps in that 13-page Word document and merging them down into configuration as code. And then after that, once we've got the deployment, what else can the build do? So source control. I started out, I went to GitHub. Here's my uh, project in GitHub. Um, network being what it is, I'm actually not going to use this. But there's the code in GitHub. Achievement one, unlocked. Woohoo! So now I want to get to the point where I can build. Here's my Visual Studio project. I've got it checked into um, source control, and we're going to go do the build. I've got a Team City environment set up. You could use Jenkins, you could use VSTS. Um, friends don't let friends use source safe. New project. So the cool part is that it'll walk you through creating that first project. Create project. I love the idea of going to GitHub. If I was using a GitHub URL, that would be really cool. I'm instead going to say this is .NET Web Application. Ah. And I will go create a build configuration. Again, .NET Web Application. Next, it will ask me to choose a VCS route. I'm going to choose Git, and I will say this is um, dot .NET Web Application, and that VCS route is a folder here on my hard drive. So I've got that VCS route. The um, Team City now, now knows how to connect to source control. And I'll go hit my build steps. My first build step. Let me get it to auto detect the build steps because it can go analyze my project. It can say, hey, is this a node project? Is it a .NET project? Can I find a package.json or can I find a solution file? It's found a solution file. I like that. Let's use that build step. I'm going to come in here for a minute, and I'm going to say, instead of building on Visual Studio 2013, I'm going to flip it to 2015. Those are the build tools I happen to have installed on my machine. And I'd like to build release. I've got that build step. Let's add a few more build steps. I'm going to say, um, before I do that, I'm going to need to run NuGet Restore. And Here's my path to NuGet. Ah. And I'm going to say restore. NuGet restore. I'm going to add one more build step. What's really cool is here in my solution, when I do a .NET restore or NuGet restore, here in my packages directory, but because I pulled in that um, X unit dot console project, I have xunit.runner.console tools. There's my test runner. So I'm going to grab exactly that path, packages.xunit.console. There's that executable, and the command parameters, I've got, for as fun as it is watching me type, I'm going to go grab that test DLL. It's in the release directory. And I'm going to have it output end unit test results in this test file. That sounds great. I'm going to reorder these build steps. I'd rather do the new get restore before I try to build based on those packages. I'm going to add a trigger. This trigger is a VCS trigger. So basically, when I commit things, it will kick off a build. Now I'm going to add one more thing. I'm going to add a build feature. This build feature will be a 
XML report processing. I'm going to choose the um, end unit report processor. And I'm going to say, when you find star.tests.xml, I want you to treat that as my test results. That was the um, test result file that I wrote in the last step. Here I'm writing it, I'm getting it to pull back into Teen City. I've built my build. It hooks to my source control. Whenever a source control change comes, it kicks off the build. It's going to do a few steps, the NuGet restore, the Visual Studio step, and run the unit tests. I'm ready to kick off a build. Here's the part where everyone crosses their fingers. Are the demo gods with us? What stupid things did I do in my solution? What I love about this part, though, is here's the details of the current step that it's doing. I can also get details about um, who did what. As I dig into it, here's the overview that tells me a whole lot about, hey, it was triggered by me. <laughs> I can see um, the steps it's running. I can also go look into the build log. Here's the command output. So as it does each step, here's the console output for that step. So I see here in my unit test project, it ran all the tests. And then it collected the results. Once this build is done, I can come back in here and I have the new tab, tests. Here's the results of my tests. It looks like they all passed. That's wonderful. I have the test order, which is kind of interesting. Achievement unlocked. We have a build. We have it running tests. So we've built tests, and we have the tests, but until we run the tests as part of every build, they aren't real tests. As soon as you have one test running as part of the build, getting it from one to 100 or 1,000 is easy. Getting it from zero to one, that's what we just accomplished, and that's really cool. So we've got the build. It's doing all the things. Let's do the deployment. I walk in here to Octopus Deploy, and this is just a standard Octopus Deploy install. I love this dashboard, this wizard that walks me through all the steps. Now, all of these are links when I first started up. Um, because I've done this once before, then all of the ones that I was going to use are no longer links. But let's do exactly that, create environments. So I'll add my first environment. This will be my dev environment. Let's add another environment. I'll call this my test environment. Octopus has a concept of environments and then deployment targets. Or I could think of this as machines. How many machines are in your test environment? One, two. How many machines are in your prod environment? Three, five. Don't say one. So I can create my environment, and then I can add various machines to it. I'm going to say this is a listening tentacle, which means that Octopus Deploy Server can push content into this tentacle. Tentacle? Octopus? I thought that was really cool. This will be running on localhost. I'm going to say this is localhost dev. It's in the dev environment. I'm going to give it a role of web. And these roles can be whatever you'd like. So I could just as easily say this is a database project, or this is the um, website, or this is the application. Here's the thumbprint of the tentacle. That's the SSL cert thumbprint. Um, the server also has an SSL cert. They're self-signed certs. But because they completely agree on each other, then I know that communication between the server and the tentacle is secure. I'll add another deployment target into test. Localhost test. This is also a web role. And now I have my environment set up. Back in the dashboard, add a deployment target. We did that. Um, let's create, go create a package. 
I'll create the package here in Team City. I'll walk back into my build. Um, and I will create an additional build step. So after I've got these things, I want to create this package that says, here's all of the assets that I want to put on the machine. These are really enticing. I'm going to avoid them. Because what's really cool is under the hood, they just call octo.exe. And so I'm just going to use a command line and use octo.exe directly. I wish it used my path here, it doesn't, so I'm going to put in the full path to octo.exe. And then let's dig into this command. This says, given that package that will be at web application one slash obj slash obpact slash web application one dot build number dot new package, let me send that to the server on localhost 8090, which happens to be the URL of my server here. So I'm going to take that package and I'm going to send it off. Well, how do I then go build that package? Well, I'm going to walk back into my Visual Studio step and let's say go build that package. Run Octopack. Because I've got that Octopus Deploy um, Jenkins, or Team City plugin, and I've added the NuGet package into my solution, I just have Run Octopack and away it goes. What's my Octopack version? I'm going to say that Octopack version is my build number. Well, right now, my build number is 1, 2, 3, and, and Octopus and Visual Studio really want a 1.2.3.4 type number. So I'm going to come back in here into my general settings, my build number format, and I'm going to say 1.0.buildcounter.0. It's not quite Semver, but we're working in that direction. In time, it'd be nice to get this pulled into a variable as well. So we've got that command line that will build the package now as part of the solution. This will trigger the, um, publish the package then to the Octopus server, and then let's add one more build step that will actually um, kick off the deploy. Executable, I'll grab that octo path again. It will create a release. The project is this .NET web application project. It'll go grab that build number, that 1.0. whatever my build number is, .0, deploy it to my dev environment. It'll send that to the Octopus server on localhost 8090. And the API key is this octo key, API key. This is that mechanism where my Team City server can communicate correctly with my Octopus server, that octo key. Let's go build one of those. So here in Octopus, I'm going to come into my profile, and I'm going to choose API keys, and I'm going to say new API key. This new API key will be Team City, and here's my API key. Ah. So I'll come back in here to um, Team City, and I will create a parameter. This will be octo key. That's what I happen to choose its name. Um, its value will be here. And I'm going to go into the spec and say this is a password. It will be read only, and it will be hidden. I'm going to push save. I'm going to push save again. Close this. That is the last time I will see the API key ever. Here inside Team City, it's locked. Even if I go edit it, I don't get its value. Here in Octopus Deploy, it's, it has that nice box when I saved, uh, when I created that key that said, store this in a safe place. Because I stored it in both places and they agree, then that's okay. I've got that API key. So here in Team City, I've got now five build steps. New get restore, build my solution, including the, the Octopus Deploy package, run my unit tests, 
push that um, NuGet package up to the Octomix deploy server, and then kick off a release. That release is in this .NET Web application project, and that's the next step for us. I've uploaded a package. I'm going to create a project. Projects. This project is the .NET Web Application Project. And what should it do when it deploys? Well, I'll add my first step. By the way, these steps are particularly cool. As we get into moving away from deploying to our pets and deploying more towards um, Docker containers, then, yeah, my build switches from running a Visual Studio compile to running Docker build. But for now, I'm going to deploy an, ACE, an IIS website, and here's my um, deployment. I will deploy this on web roles. This is web application one. That's the name of the package that I'm pushing up here. I want it to be an IIS website. Here's all the things that I would normally configure in IIS. I'm going to configure them here in Octopus Deploy so that Octopus can push those settings into place. The application pool, web application one dash, well, in my dev and my test environment, because they're both running on the same machine, those names would collide. So I'm going to use an Octopus variable here in the same way that I used a team city variable, and I'm going to choose Octopus environment name. So therefore, the application pool name in dev is web application one slash dev. And in test, it'll be web application one slash test. I'll do the same thing for the website name. And then here in the bindings, I don't want both sites to try and run simultaneously on port 80. So I'm going to do that similar thing. I'll say 8,000 plus this variable. And I have environment sort order. Now Octopus actually doesn't have math like this, so I'm just going to say like this. Now sort order, zero based. Dev will be zero, test will be one, therefore port 8000 will be dev, and port 8001 will be test. I would like anonymous authentication, and I'll disable Windows authentication. I love this part where it says, hey, I'm going to automatically transform release.config, and I'll go look for environment.configs too. So if I have web.dev.config, it just gets applied automatically. And it gets applied at the octopus step, not at the build step, which is wonderful because that means that same package is applicable both to dev and test and prod. I love this part as well, where I can come in here and say, hey, I would like to substitute variables in additional files. I can go drop my Git version into my master page or drop my deployment date into an interesting place. We won't do that in this case. I've, confined, I've built my build steps now. I've got uh, Team City building that package, pushing it off to Octopus. I've got Octopus then deploying it to my environments. That was step five here in Octopus. I come back into Team City, and I run that build. The cool part now is that instead of seeing one, two, three, we now have that one dot zero dot number format. So I'll automatically get incremented versions. Digging into the build log, we can see that um, I get this nice yellow step in the Visual Studio step because I don't have the um, FX cop rules set up just so. But now it's going off into step five. It's going to kick off my octopus step. I can come back here into octopus looking at my um, octopus build. .NET web application. So octopus is kicking off. I can dig into the octopus details as well, looking at that task log either in you know, this way or I can flip actually to the command line that octopus ran. Now I come back into IIS where I didn't have any sites before. 
And now I have my dev website. What's really cool now is because I've built that um, product, that package that represents the software at that version, I don't need to rebuild it to get to the next environment. Rather, I can walk into this package and I can say promote to test. Send this package to the next environment. Deploy now. It will send that same package off to test. In a second, we'll see um, a new website here in IIS. It now has 8001. And if I go to that website, I see my product is now um, deployed to both dev and test. So ultimately, we took source control, we built a build, we ran some tests, we deployed it to things. What else could we do? Could we minify JavaScript? Could we run integration tests? Could we validate the website just by you know, hitting the home page? That's really fun. Can we write our version number in interesting places? Here's where we go dig through that 13-page Word document and enumerate all of the steps here in code. Ultimately, this was easy. In a half hour, I built the build step. You can do it. Go do it. Any questions? Thanks for playing. We do have one question. I'm just curious. Um, you've, you've used these other open source tools. Are you familiar with team services for the Microsoft stack? And the, all of those elements are integrated into that tool set? Yes. Why would I choose open source when there are in-the-box solutions? Visual Studio Team Services is wonderful. Um, it has the build in it. It also has um, project uh, management things where typically we'd lean on JIRA. It has interesting integrations. It has automation test things. And, and that can build it all into one place. If you want to run it on premise, that uh, package is TFS. If you want to run it in the cloud, the package is Visual Studio Team Services. And it's actually the same product. Why would I use open source tools instead? Uh, personal preference. I like to pick the best of breed products. I don't use Microsoft Works. And the best of breed products for deployment is Octopus Deploy. And therefore, by stringing together these open source tools that do really elegant things, I don't have that additional weight of you know, having to stay in the box. Alternatively, if you really like staying in the box, I could set up a TFS server and do really well and not have to leave that very well-tested confines of, of Microsoft land. What's really cool with the new Microsoft, they've really embraced open source. And so the options are now open. You aren't guided down that golden path anymore. Any other questions? We could probably do one quick one. Yeah, Elizabeth. It's good to represent this side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I had a quick question. So you said it only takes a half hour, but that feels like a long time to me. So I'm wondering if there is a way like, do these have um, configuration files that you can just put a bunch of data in for each defining of each test and deployment? Or is it all, like, through the web interface with these tools? That is a great question. Do I, do I need to be confined to the web tools, or can I do this more through configuration as code? Ultimately, that's exactly where I go when I do this for real. The pointy-clicky gets me so far, but pretty soon I'll fall off of that. And here's why. So we have two or three teams on the same Jenkins server. And they each want different plugins, or they want plugins of different versions. And in time, those will start to collide. A best practice here is not to use all of the built-in plugins, but rather have one task that says, launch this build script. And that build script enumerates all of the tasks. Here we said, launch Visual Studio Build. That's an MS Build command. So I say MS Build, my solution name, and I just do the things. All of the Octopack command lines, all of the NuGet command lines, all of that those were just command lines. Just copy those, put them into a build.bat or a build.ps1 or a build.sh. That would be really fun. And then get your build server to kick that off. The added benefit of using that build.sh instead is that you can version that build together with your solution, with your product. And so as your product starts to evolve, 
your build evolves as well. I need to build that thing that we did two months ago or last year. Hold on, hold on, let me, let me go futz with the build server until I can figure out how it used to work before. When you have that build file baked into your source code, you can build what it was at the point where you wanted to bake into that source code. I love having a build.sh. Okay, Rob is not local, but we have him for the next hopefully couple of days. Yes. So join him at the expert table, grab him. Again, we're building community, we're answering questions. This is not just a la 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 inspired conference. So grab him and ask him more of these questions. Our speakers are making themselves available. And in the meantime, big, big round of applause. It can be done. Microsoft. Thank you.